Hallelujah. We bless the Lord. We bless the Lord this morning. Anybody has a hallelujah inside of them? Hallelujah. Every now and again, I feel that hallelujah that might be buried inside of me. And man, when it comes out, it's a hallelujah. Jesus. Anybody has one of those? Yes. Sister Veronica. Yeah, I think I, I think you just shook a while ago. There's one that was coming out of you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sister Jennifer. Hallelujah. 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 Sister Alicia. Yes, yes, sir. Hallelujah. 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 Sister Me. Hallelujah. I knew there was one in there. I knew it. I knew it. Glory. Wayne. Just a amen, 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. And no apologies yes. either. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The angels around the throne are saying, Hallelujah. Holy, holy. They're saying that 24 7. Hallelujah. And we just get to say it every now and again. Oh my God. We should go around all the time. Hallelujah. That's the highest praise. That's the highest praise. That's the highest you can get to it. Amen. Something going on in your life, and you, don't and you even, you can't fathom, you can't understand what it is. Just give out a hallelujah, and the forces of darkness just have to flee. Amen. That's the highest praise. That's one of our weapons right there. Amen. So you may be seated, and thank you so much for participation in praise and worship. It's so much more uh, fun and I, I, I call it fun because I believe in enjoying myself in the house of the Lord. Really, <laughs> I don't know. Some people might think that you can only have fun at a ball game or at a party or something like that. And when you go to the house of the Lord, it's like, mm, no, 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 I have fun. Don't you have fun? Do you have fun in the house of the Lord? Hallelujah! Yes, I'm hallelujah again. So we bless the Lord God for his goodness, for his kindness, for his mercy. And we want to welcome all of you sitting here. Welcome again. And we wish to welcome all those who will be watching later to Restore and Church of the Living God. I am Sandra. Wayne is over here. And we are, we've been um, called to the ministry. We did not know that um, we would have been doing this, actually. But it became evident that the Lord was calling us into ministry. And so we decided that we were going to rebel. No. <laughs> Even though we didn't see ourselves as ministers, we um, had to agree with God and say, okay, I, we surrender all. <laughs> and so this is it, almost two years. In fact, next week, Sunday, we are going to be celebrating two years of ministry here. It was actually on the 26th of July that we started for the first time during the pandemic. What a time to start <laughs> 19, 19, in 2020. Um, but God has been gracious, and so we are going to just do a little celebration here, nothing big, um, just to give Him the glory. Because if we don't celebrate, it would be like we're not really honoring him. So we want to honor him. That's it. That's the whole idea. So we um, decided last week that we're going to do something a little different. Um, we preach mostly, but I think a lot of times we end up teaching. And I that is good. Oh, oh, when he says, he says he teaches and I... <laughs> so you agree? <laughs> So, but we're, we're going to study on the Holy Spirit because he is so very important. And um, we might do a little recap of what he had taught last week. And then um, we're going to share this. So we just pray that it will be a blessing to you. It will minister to your spirits. And we had um, given out some notebooks earlier. Um, I hope you brought your notebooks again. And... Um, so, but the, um, I don't know where our children are today. I, I don't think they slept in because um, they, they should be more refreshed than we are, huh? <laughs> well, maybe they've been playing around quite a bit. Thank you. I don't mind what I want to have here still. Okay, yes. so. Yes, thank you. 
Thank you. Yes, thank you for all being here with us to participate. What? Yes, thank you for being hanging with us during these um, months and weeks. And um, we want to continue this, as Sandra said, this um, teaching from the Word of God of our important companion, our Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. He is so good. Without Him, we would be lost. Would, would, without Him, we'd be nothing. <clears throat> so I want to continue. Lord God, we just I just ask the Lord God to let this teaching, let this word, Lord God, go out, Lord God, into the universe, Lord God, into this world, into every heart, Lord God, every ear that's here in Lord God, that it will not come back void, Lord God, that it will do its work what it was determined to do, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, in your precious name. So last week, I, there was a, a, a screen that I, that I created that um, somehow they, I created it, but they copied it into the, into the um, program. <laughs> so it's the first one listed on there, and it's the, uh, the word pneumothero. I was trying to pronounce it, it's kind of hard because the first time I'm reading it. Pneumatology, right? Yeah. Um, so that is the study of the Holy Spirit, right? And it says there, or spiritual being. The Greek type translation, pneuma, right? So that's pneuma, the wind or the breath. This beautiful wind that we had come right yes. now could be a, 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 an example of a Holy Spirit, yeah. right? So, um, so I'm going to go and start off with um, with what the the the, the three in one. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. God, He is what we call omnipresent, right? I think Santa Mugman mentioned that last week, maybe not. Omnipresent. Omni meaning all, everywhere, always, right? Present meaning being everywhere, always, everywhere. He's over there, He's over there, He's back over there, He's in Europe, is in Africa, at the same time. all at the same time, and in our hearts at the same time, in our minds, omnipresent. That's 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 who he is. That's how awesome he he is. In Jeremiah twenty three twenty four, it meant, it states this: that can a man hide himself? Oh, let me drop it. Can a man hide himself in hiding places so do not so you do not see him? declares the Lord. Do I not fill the heavens and the earth? declares the Lord. So he is everywhere, just as he said there. He said this. Right? He's everywhere. He cannot can a man hide himself in a hiding place? So do not see him. So you do not see him. He clears the Lord. Do I not fill the heavens, the whole heavens, and the whole earth from end to end, from north to south, from east to west? He is there. Amen. That's when he be omnipresent. In Psalm 139, 7 through 10. He says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, which is yeah. hell, is where we go when we, those who don't know you, go. Behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me. 
and your right hand will lay hold of, of me. So again, he's talking, he's everywhere. Cannot, cannot, cannot go from him. Where you, wherever you might be, you could be hide yourself underneath the ground, he's there. You could be in the coffin, he's there. All over. You can't find, he, he, he can't go anywhere where he's, he, he can't be found. The other omni is omniscient. The word omni, what we just said, comes from, it means all, everywhere, right? Shint, omniscient, omniscient, comes from the word, derived from the word science, right? That means he knows everything. You know, science is the study of anything and everything, right? The study of knowledge of things. He knows all things. Amen. So God's knowledge is unlimited, right? He created the earth, He created us, He created everything. So it's, His knowledge is unlimited. Knowing that God is omniscient should, go, should, should allow us to trust His ways, His word, and His timing. Though we don't know all of answers, God does. That's how we love him and trust him, and 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 our, he's our beloved, yeah. because all that he does. I mean, think about it. Who would not want to follow a, a person that knows everything, can see everything, can go, it can be everywhere at That's the right. same time. That's awesome. I would. If you don't, something wrong with you. <laughs> something is definitely wrong if you don't want to glorify, lift up, be, let him be your God of this, of a person that is, has that much power Amen. and ability. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. That's right. In 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11, says, Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Uh, no, 1 Corinthians 2, 10. Yeah, there you go. There's not? Oh, wait a minute. Okay. Yes, that's the one. No, uh, that for that one you had first. I was reading. I don't know what I'm gonna read. Write down. Written down here. So, First uh, Corinthians two ten and eleven. Yes, but God had revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Sees, searches all things, deep things. I mean, God. Deep for us is nothing compared to the deep things of God. He goes way, 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 way more than we can even imagine. Right? And verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of man, saith the Spirit? of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. He knoweth no man but the Spirit of God does. <clears throat> each and every one of us. Each and every one that he knows. And the next, the last omni, omni all, always, is potent, omnipotent. Potent means, you know, strong, powerful, Right? And I think of how powerful God is. I know you all have experienced His power in your lives, right? But I just, you know, we're just talking about something that's occurred in, in the U.S. here recently, back on the 24th of June. Back in 1973, this, the, 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 the law, 72, Law from the um, yeah the law 
was presented to the United States from the Supreme Court about the abortion, right? Abortion was not, it was then illegal. Legal, legal. And since then, the Christian family, the Christian church, the individual, has been praying and praying and praying and doing all kinds of things, marches and meetings and trying to let this world know, let the US, US know that it, that is wrong, that is wrong, killing the innocence, right? It is so wrong. God didn't intend for 60, I just looked it up this morning, 60 million children lost their lives in the U.S. That's more than all the world wars from the beginning in the U.S. put together. That was not his plan. He's a God of life. If that was his plan, he would not be a God of life. He would be a God of death. And that's not him. I'm sorry, it's very controversial. Very, very controversial. Right now, you see it on the TV all the time, both sides. But we as Christians, we as followers of God, have to understand and have to realize that that was not his intention to kill. Amen. Right? Amen. In Psalms 62 and 11, it says, God has spoken once. Twice have I heard this, that powerful longeth, power, that, that power belongeth unto God. Again, that power belongs to God. And in Acts 1 and 8, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. So if God has power, the Lord Jesus has power. The Holy Ghost has power. But they're all one. That's right. <clears throat> Last week I um, I spoke of the personality, the characteristics of of the Holy Ghost, right? I said in June in, in John 6:13. It's not listed there. In John 6, 13, he, say, he, he, shall, he said that he shall not speak of himself. Mm -hmm. Right? So the Holy Ghost shall not speak. Speak of himself. In John 14, 26, he said he shall teach all things. In Acts 20, 23, he said he shall testify of me. I mean that he testifies. In John 15, 26, we said that the Holy Ghost witness in every city. All right, so he witnesses. In Isaiah 63.10, we talked about that he grieved, just like we grieve. So that's trying to say he's, he's a person, he had personality. In Acts 5 and 9, he was tested. All right, we've talked about that last week. So today I'm going to add a couple more. He has a will. Just like we have a will. In 1 Corinthians, 12, 1 Corinthians 12 and 11, where right before this, in the Word, it was talking about all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Right? And in, in, in verse 11, he says, But all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit dividing to every man severely, severally as he will as he will he wants to give every man these gifts as he the Holy Spirit wills alright so the will of the Holy Spirit guides believers by denying permission for certain actions right? we've all wanted, we've all prayed for certain things and it did not work out the way we felt, we thought it should have come to pass, right? Mm -hmm. And there was a reason. Right. Because right. the Holy Spirit knows all things, right? So He knows what is good 
And what is not so good, he know when we are to get that 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 that, that request. Alright? So in, in here's an example in Acts 16 and 6. It says now when they had gone through Phrygia, the region of Galatia, this is the the um, disciples and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost forbid them to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Mysia, they, they assayed or considered, pondered, assessed whether they to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them, allowed them not to go. All right, so there it is. They weren't the Holy Spirit prevented them from going into Bithynia. Right? Like 16, 6, right? Yeah, well, and then, and 7, yes. And, yes, right, that's all 16, 16 through 7. 6 through 7. And there's another in 16, 10, at 16, 10, the Holy Spirit granted permission. It says, and after he had been had seen the vision, immediately he endeavored, desired his his, his, his goal, we, to go. We. Yeah, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering what the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. So the permission was given to them to go and preach the gospel. They thought about it and they came together and said they will and the Holy Spirit was with them and, and, and allowed them to go. So that the Holy Spirit gave them permission. So there is the will of the Holy Spirit saying yes or saying no to us, right? Right here to the, to the disciples. We know that God is love, right? Jesus pre preaches love. He is love. And so is the Spirit. Because they're all one. In Galatians 5 and 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. It is joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Again, such there is no law. So the Spirit is love again. All right? In Romans 15, 30. said, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, for the love of the Spirit, there it is again, the love of the Spirit, He is love, that ye strive together with me in your prayers for prayers to God for me. Amen. So again, He is Spirit. So these are the some more personalities that to add to what I covered last week. And he intercedes. You know, a lot, a lot of times you pray warriors intercede and you pray for situations, you pray for your loved one, you pray for those that, that, that you know need a touch from God. Yeah. <laughs> or the Spirit made us to put on your heart to start pre uh, praying for that individual urgent you may get up early in the night and start praying because you don't know the spirit of god just put something in you to pray for that situation pray for the individual Amen. right you don't even know why or where or how but you just know you gotta pray that's intercession so this holy spirit intercedes he prays to god on behalf of, uh, of others and in romans 8 26 as i finish up here says, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray, but as we ought, but the Spirit itself make an intercession for us. With groanings which cannot be uttered. Huh? Says himself, right. Okay? So there it is. He intercedes for us. The Holy Spirit. So that's the Spirit. So all these things are 
personalities of the Holy Spirit, personalities that when we receive the Holy Spirit, we, uh, we have those, those, those personalities also. So just to prove that He is a person, yes. just like me and you, not just a spirit, but a, a person, a real person. Okay? All right. And turn it over to... Yes, already. <laughs> turn it over to our beloved... Pastor Sandra Stewart. All right. Well, praise the Lord. God is good. Did anybody get anything out of that? Yes, I think I saw some people writing and writing. Yeah, this is good, right? Praise the Lord. You know, it's an honor, really, a privilege to even talk about the Holy Spirit, this third person of the Godhead. Um, as I said, we just felt after this period of time that you know, we had not really ministered about the Holy Spirit. Of course, he has been in our meetings and our services, but we just felt like, you know, we needed to focus on him because especially in these last days, my God, it's, um, he is playing a very vital role. He did play a vital role from the very beginning because if you recall, in Genesis, God the Father said, let us make man. So he was talking not to himself like he was losing it, but he was talking to Father himself, Son, the second person, and the Holy Spirit, the third person, Godhead. Um, so you've heard about the fact that he's not an it vapor. He's not, as I said last week, a doppy. <laughs> he's not some kind of a smoke or a cloud that you can put your hand and then your hand comes out at the other side because we don't understand sometimes because we're lacking in understanding. We think, well, this is a vapor, he's a vapor, he's an it, but he's a he, he's a person as you've heard. So thank you very much, Pastor Wayne, for bringing that out about the nature of the Holy Spirit and, um, and the personality of the Holy Spirit. Um, I believe you had mentioned that he speaks Yes, so he does speak, he, he does have a voice. And when he speaks, um, we were discussing that, I think yesterday, that sometimes people will say, well, I can't, I can't hear God speak. He does speak audibly. Some of us have heard him speak audibly, an audible voice where you can hear a voice like somebody, like one of us talking to each other. But there are times when he will not necessarily give you that audible um, voice. You, you won't hear him speaking audibly. You will hear him speaking in your spirit. Yes. You will hear him like, like you ever hear people say, one mind told me to do this. Yes. And I'm like, which mind was that? <laughs> one, mind, one mind told me to go over to Mary Jane because such and such and when, when I went over to Mary Jane, you know what, she was on the floor and I'm so glad I went over there because I was able to help her or call the ambulance or something, resuscitate her. That was not a mind, that was the Holy Spirit. Right? We're led by the Spirit because he speaks. And um, I mean, I could, we could be here till next week with me telling you how I've heard him tell me stuff and when I acted on it, I realized that I had great success yes. and not disaster. Mm -hmm. I think I've shared some time before that when he spoke into my spirit um, just before I left a prayer meeting one night with our daughter, who was nine years old at the time, that he, something was going on. I felt something in my spirit, mm -hmm. very unsettling. Yes. That was the Holy Spirit speaking and telling me to keep ourselves covered. And five minutes up the road, a drunk driver hit me. See, of course, attached to that was a dream that our former pastor had that she saw someone in a coffin. 
and that person later on we found out when the Lord took the veil off her eyes was me. So in other words, when the Holy Spirit is, he, he speaks. And when he speaks, we've got to be quiet enough. Our spirits have got to be quiet enough. We've got to be listening keenly amidst all the sound, the other sounds that we're hearing all around us because the other sounds, the enemy will make them amplified. He'll make them loud so that when the Holy Spirit speaks, we can't hear him. And he doesn't come to us and say, Sandra, such and such and such. He doesn't do that. That's not his nature. He's quiet like a dove. A dove, if you are not careful, if you approach a dove, what will it do? If you approach a dove suddenly, what will the dove do? What will a bird do? It will fly away, right? So the Holy Spirit is like, he's not a dove, but he's like a dove, very gentle. And so when he alights upon us like this, like this, and he tries to speak to us, if we're not listening carefully, if we're not keen enough to his movement in our lives, we could miss it and we could lose out, right? So anyway, so that um, just wanted to add to that, um, you know, about his speaking and um, listen for his voice because he does speak. Sometimes we might be seeking direction and we, we might say, Lord, I need a word from you today. I need a word from you right now because of a situation that I am facing, which you already know about. I don't even have to tell you because before I tell you, you know it because you are what? Omniscient, you know all things. So I need a word, God. Could you please? And by faith, I've done it. And I'm sure some of you have done it. What you do? Open up the word. And you do this. God, I, need, I, God, I really need a word. Jesus, I need a word. I need a word, Lord. <laughs> How many have ever done that? Yes. Yes? And has it worked for yes. you? Yes. It has it worked? Okay. It works every time, doesn't it? We wait before him. We might not be seeing something right away as we read and we keep reading and we keep saying, oh, he just spoke to me. He just told me exactly what I need to do. Okay, so this Holy Spirit here, mm, he's, 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 mm, he's amazing, isn't he? He's amazing and we could never ever do without him. Amen? So we're going to move on to something which is a little heavier. Sensitive, the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit. He's sensitive. We're just talking about the fact that he's like a dove. He's not a dove, but he's like a dove, very gentle. It says here the Holy Spirit has a sensitive nature. It means he has feelings. The Holy Spirit has feelings? Yeah, Wayne just said. Right? He has a personality. And as people, we understand that we have feelings, right? We have feelings. We, we can be joyful, we can be sad, right? Those are feelings, right? We can be hurt. So he has feelings that can be affected by the actions of man, you and I. Because of the sensitive nature of the Holy Spirit, the Bible warns, and the word here is you, but I'm gonna say we, I'm including myself, the Bible warns that we should not lie to the Holy Spirit. Ooh, heavy stuff. Lie to the Holy Spirit. Very, very important. Be forewarned. And in Acts chapter 5 and verses, I'm going to read from, I think I have 1 to, one to 6 there. I want us to look at that. Now, Wayne had brought this out last week um, when he was, um, talking about was it talking about how the Holy Spirit knows um, different things I'm trying to remember because, but what, what we're going to bring out now is the fact that he does know everything he's omniscient he was aware of what was going on with Ananias and Sapphira. There were Christians in the church, believers, 
And um, in the early church, when the church just started, after the Holy Spirit came, as Jesus had promised on the day of Pentecost, which we'll go into that later, the church came together. They were in one accord. They had all things common. If somebody was lacking and somebody had, then that person would make up for the lack of the other person. So they had things, you know, they, they, were, they were considerate of each other. So they were, what they were doing was, those who had would sell possessions, lands, etc., and they would bring it to the apostles' feet and distribution will be made to those who did not have. So Ananias and Sapphira, they said, well, you know what, we're, we're gonna do that too. We wanna do something like that. We, we, wanna, we wanna be a part of this. We wanna be a part of this. So in verse one of chapter, Acts chapter five, let me get one person. Well, nobody has read yet, right? So let me get some readers here. Who wants to read um, verse 1, Acts chapter 5? But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession mm -hmm. and kept back a part of the, of the price. His wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. All right, next person. Thank you. Peter said, Ananias, why not Satan fill thine heart, the light of the Holy Ghost, and to keep back part of the price of the land? Next person. While it remained, not, was it not thine own, and have thou soul? Was it not thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not light upon them, but unto God. Mm -hmm. And verse 5. And, and as hearing these words fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came all on all them that heard these things. Thank you. Wow. That's, that's heavy stuff, isn't it? Yeah. So later on, if you continue reading, you will see where his wife he didn't even know what had happened to him. Why it's a pity somebody <laughs> didn't go touch her and tell her, listen. If your husband just told a lie and he fell dead. So I, if I were you, I would go in and make sure. In fact, don't want to go in at all. Because <laughs> you're going to be just like him. Hello. But nobody went and told her. Mm. <laughs> she could have repented right there. She could have really gone in, you know, and said, um, I know my husband said such and such, but actually we sold it with the intention of giving all of it. You know, nobody really pushed us to do it. It was supposed to be from the willingness and the goodness of our hearts. But um, we did keep back a part of it. So I'll go, go, I'll go back to the house and get the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, nobody told her. Oh, poor lady. Oh, God. So she went in and said the same lie to husband. And what happened? <laughs> told a lie to the Holy Ghost. You see, sometimes people think they're talking to other people and don't realize that if the Spirit of God is in that person, the Spirit of God will understand what is going on. See, because he's all-knowing, right? Omniscient. And he's everywhere, so he was there too when they were putting all this stuff and planning all this stuff. He was already there. So people don't understand. They think that when they're talking to each other, that it's just be talking to you, but they don't realize that if you have that spirit that can discern my actions, then you can say to me, Sandra, you didn't give all of it. You only gave a part of it. Now, why are you lying to the Holy Ghost? Because the Holy Ghost is already showing me that you didn't give all of it. And we didn't even ask you for it anyway. So the Holy Ghost here, the Bible warns us specifically not to lie to the Holy Ghost. Very dangerous. Look at it, they lost their lives. I was thinking these people could have been alive if they had not yielded to Satan 
and lied to the Holy Ghost. See? Um, another thing is resisting the Spirit. We can resist the Spirit, you know. It says the Holy Spirit has specific ministries on behalf of the believer, which will be discussed later on. But resisting the Holy Spirit is not yielding to him when we when he tries to minister in your life, my life. And um, in Acts chapter 7 and verse 51, it talks about the resisting of the Spirit. If we can just look at that, I'm going to bring out something here which I think will interest you. Acts 7 verse 51, it says, Ye stiff net. Wow. Stiff neck. That sounds like a, a, what we call a crick neck. <laughs> when you have a stiff neck, right? You, you can't, it, it can't really move it, can you? It, it's so painful, don't it? You, you try, you do, oh, is that, you, don't, you just want to keep it one way. Because if you move it, it's like, ah, oh, it hurts. So think about a stiff necked person is one who does not want to move one way or the other, right? Stiff necked. Very stubborn. Ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart. The heart has not been cleansed. It has not been 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 washed by the blood of Jesus. It has not been it, it, it has not been dealt with by God, by the Spirit. Cir uncircumcised in heart and ears. Can you imagine that? I've never heard of uncircumcised ears. <laughs> you ever heard about uncircumcised heart, but uncircumcised ears? Which means that we can't, we, we, it's going forth, information is going forth, but our ears say, ah, oh, I'm not going to hear it, sorry. If it comes in this one, I'm definitely going to make sure it goes through this one. Oops. Right? It says, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. And this was Stephen talking here, because I'm telling you, this man just gave the gospel from A to Z, and he never cared. And at the very end of this chapter, if you read it, he was what? Stoned, right? But he was speaking in such a way that the Holy Spirit was so uh, um, on him. He was so anointed, Sister Me, that the conviction, conviction came forth. He didn't, he didn't mince words when he spoke. So he was saying, you're stiff-necked. That, 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 the, you know, what, what's, being shown here, it's relating the, the feeling of the Holy Spirit, more or less, saying you're stiff-necked, stiff-necked, uncircumcised. The Greek word for resist is antipipto, A-N-T-I-P-I-P-T-O, and it means, means to fall against, fall against, or pull against, like a backsliding heifer, which is like a, a cow, right? That will not be led. So picture that, picture that. So this, they're trying to get this cow into the pen or whatever, or to go wherever, and they're dragging this cow, this heifer, and the heifer is pulling against the direction that they're trying to get this cow to go in. And I mean, that's stubbornness. You heard about a stubborn mule, right? That stubbornness where you, you, you have all intention to take that mule or that heifer from one place to the next, maybe to bring it to safety, but that heifer is not understanding that. That heifer doesn't understand that you're trying to get him to get, get some food or some water. And so he's like, has anybody ever worked with um, cattle? No? You have? And you're trying to pull the... Donkey or the donkey. mule, oh, donkey, yes. or the, somewhere, and some of them will cooperate, right? But some will be like, not today, not tomorrow, not next week, I will not be going. Hello, you could pull me, but I'm going to go against the grain. You're not going to get me, and you just what? Give up? Well, this is how God was describing the children of Israel. And sometimes we too are stiff-necked, right? Uncircumcised in heart and ears. And we resist the Holy Ghost. So, um, 
That's, we don't want to be like that because when we resist the Holy Ghost, we could be definitely missing out on some things that we should have. And we go the other way. We do our thing, have our way, and we end up being destroyed, right? The Holy Spirit, when he comes and he's trying to lead us, he's not leading us into something that's going to harm us something that is not good for us. He's leading us into something that is good. He's leading us to green pastures, right? But we might not see it that way because we have some other agenda. And we're like, that's not what I have planned for my life right now. I don't know about this. I think I'm going to just kick against the pricks. I'm gonna go against the grain and I am gonna stay right here and God, I don't think I want to go over there. So I'm going to resist like the heifer. Resisting the Holy Spirit. We can resist the Holy Spirit. And that's not good. Because it's going to be for our bad. Amen? Amen. And we don't want to resist him. Another thing that we can do. Um, because he's such a sensitive person of the Godhead. Very sensitive, the Holy Spirit. We can quench him. Quench. You've heard that term, haven't you? Quench in the spirit. It says, you, we, quench the Holy Spirit when we refuse to do what the Holy Spirit would have us to do. The word quench is used elsewhere in the Bible in reference to putting out a fire. So you think about a water that somebody, I'm sorry, a fire that somebody has lit. And that fire looks like it's going to be on the blaze. In fact, right now in the Yosemite, in, in, in the States, in California, they have these, these fires that are burning, these giant trees. I mean, it's just, they've never seen that before, right? And they're trying to save the trees. But these fires are out of control. They're using everything. They're trying to quench the fire. They're trying to put water and everything else that can calm it down and finally get rid of this fire. So the Holy Spirit, talking about fire in Hebrews 12, 29, the Holy Spirit is a, a, a we, we have already established that the Holy Spirit is God, right? So God, it, it's saying here, is a what? Consuming fire. So that's the Holy Spirit. And just so you know, because you might want to see the word Holy Spirit, um, in Acts chapter let me see I don't think I wrote it down but in Acts chapter 2 I believe might not be in Acts chapter 2 but what I'm trying to get to is where John says I baptize you with water but there's one coming that will baptize you with with Fire. Yes, there is a fire baptism. Mm, my Jesus. He is described as being fire. He's not necessarily, he's not fire, but he's like fire. When you, when you see how he works, he consumes. And the word consumes means to, 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 to eat up or to burn up, right? A fire burns up whatever is put in there. So we usually ask the Holy Spirit to come in and consume everything inside of us that is not like God. Right? He's a consuming fire. He will burn up what is inside of us that we offer to him that, that is not of God. That is not like Christ. So when we quench the Holy Spirit, it stops the flow of his power within us. It is like throwing water on a fire. So the Bible warns, quench not the spirit in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 19. And um, let me just say that when we don't co-work or cooperate with God's spirit, that's when we quench him. Isn't that something? So there's a fire of the spirit that's moving. 
The Holy Ghost is moving. He might be moving in your life, your life, your life, my life. He might be moving in a service. But when we don't cooperate, work with him to bring about what he wants to happen, then it's like we took a bucket of water and we, we just did this whoosh, splash. And so we put him out, we put the fire out, and there's no moving of the spirit in our midst or in our lives. Um, we're going to look at First Thessalonians 5.19, and it's, it's short. Quench, read it with me, please. Quench not the spirit. Wow. That's, that's, that's something we're, we're being advised strongly not to do. Quench not the spirit. The Greek word for quench is S B E N N U M I. S B E N N U M I. Spenumi. It's pronounced Spenumi. It means to extinguish or put out, as in a fire. That's the word for quenching. Right? Very important. We want the Holy Spirit to move in our lives. We want the fire of God to burn out what needs to be burned out and to burn in us such a passion for the things of God that we don't want to be putting water on that and then whoosh, nothing is going on in our lives. Holy Spirit can't move. Another one is grieving the Spirit. Mm. Quenching the Holy Spirit is not doing what the Holy Spirit would have us do. Okay, grieving the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to give a difference between quenching and grieving, because when I was looking at this, I was thinking, oh boy, you know, kind of almost sound like they're running into each other, like they're about the same, but there's a little difference. Um, grieving the Holy Spirit is doing something that the Holy Spirit does not want us to do. The nation of Israel grieved the Holy Spirit. Um... And in Psalm 78, and verse 40, see that up there? It says, how oft did they provoke him, provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Now, you're saying this is the Old Testament and we're talking about the Holy Spirit. So how is that? Because the Holy Spirit, as far as we know, he came after Jesus left. This was in the New Testament, right? So how is it we're talking about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? Because the Holy Spirit has always been present from Genesis up until now. So back in the Old Testament, he moved upon people to do the will of God. In the New Testament, after Jesus left and he said, I'm not going to leave you comforted less. I'm sending the comforter. He will teach you all things. He will empower you, etc., etc." Right? Now, he lives inside of us. Right? Then he moved upon them. But there was no baptism of the Holy Spirit back then. But the Holy Ghost was still very present back then. The Holy Spirit from the very beginning. So here it says, they provoked him in the wilderness when the children of Israel were going from Egypt to Canaan land. They, they grieved him in the desert. Ah, oh, how often, many times. If you, you remember reading all that, sometimes God was like, no, why on earth did I create? Tell me again, why? Tell me, angels, why did I create them again? Hello, um, I'm kind of up to here. But so long-suffering, so gracious, so kind to us and to the Israelites that he just over and over and over again forgave and continually wooed them back to himself. Every single time, every single time. So, the difference now between quenching and grieving. Quenching is hindering the Holy Spirit from doing what he wants to do in us when we throw the water on the fire, his fire. We throw water on it, the fire. Grieving is hindering the Holy Spirit from being himself, from being what he could be in us. So I'm thinking, and you might be thinking that too, that grieving takes on a different form. It's, it's, it's greater 
we could quench the spirit, maybe not realizing it, that we quench the spirit. We put some water on, on him and he can't move in our lives, he can't move in our services. But when we grieve him, it's like we, we're doing a little bit more than that. It's, um, it's not accidental. It's, it's, it's like we're plainly saying, I don't want to do this. I don't want your way at all. And Ephesians 4, 30 tells us, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. It's a little bit more than just quenching. We're, we're getting to the place where we are causing him to be sorrowful. This is one that says, insult the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine? We can insult the Holy Spirit. Wow. Nobody likes to be insulted, disrespected, right? Nobody likes that. And yet, we can insult the Holy Spirit. This says, you insult the Holy Spirit. We insult the Holy Spirit by going back into sin after we have experienced forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh my goodness, so you've heard the word, the term backslidden. Somebody can backslide. Somebody can come to know Jesus Christ, ask him to come into the heart, forgive them of their sins and what have you and be walking with the Lord for a little while. But then the, the cares of this world sometimes will choke that thing that has been deposited in the person and different things happen and that person goes right back out into sin. So, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, it says, can somebody read that? Hebrews chapter, oh, I'm sorry. I, that was one I added this morning. I added 10, Hebrews 10, 29. How much sour punishment, sour. Sour punishment mm -hmm. suppose ye shall eat it thus worthy, who have trodden on the foot the Son of God, and have counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unfolded thing, and have done despite unto the Spirit of grace? Amen. Okay. Um, and... Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. I'll start that off. It says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted enlightened. So that person was walking as a Christian before and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost which means experienced him in a very intimate way, the Holy Ghost. They were baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's not an everyday Christian, not, an, not, not just someone who says, well, I just want to be saved and I just want the basics. But someone who said, I want the deep things of God. I'm going deeper. I want deep, deep, deep. So this person or these persons have experienced God in an intimate way and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Meaning that a person or those persons have gained a certain depth in God. They have been experiencing dreams, visions at a deep level. Okay. And then the next verse says, if they fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Can you imagine that? You say, well, how could we do that? How can we, how can we put God, Jesus Christ, back on the cross? Cross. He already, you know, died on the cross. They took him down, put him in Simon's grave, 
and he rose from the dead. How do you mean put him back on the cross? How can I put him back on the cross? How can you put him back on the cross? How can that happen? And that is when we have received him as Savior and Lord, and then we and, and, and come into a relationship with the Holy Spirit, and then we backslide. It's like a slap in the face to him. And we put Jesus Christ right back on the cross. Just like that. Just like that. It's like, wow. With what you did for me, it's like it never really had value. Because now I've gone back to the vomit. I've gone back. So I put you back on the cross. It's as though you never really died for me. So um, I have a note here that says, they have gone so far away from the things of God their conscience is seared. Seared like with a hot iron. When you, when you use a hot iron on cattle, that says this, this thing is it's burnt into the, the, the skin, or the hide of the cattle, right? And it means this belongs to this person or that person or that company. And um, burnt out, there's no sensitivity there. There's no feeling there. There's, there's nothing for, for God to work with, the Holy Spirit to work with. It's seared as with a hot iron. There's nothing there. It's, it's it, it, it just dead, so to speak. All right, another one is blaspheme in the spirit. And I think after that, I just have one more. But you're all looking like you're drinking it in. More, give it, give it. Okay, so blaspheme in the spirit. And I know we've heard that term blaspheme in the spirit. And sometimes there's a lot of um, maybe confusion about what that means. So let's look at Matthew 12, 31 to 32. Okay, green. Matthew 12, 31 to 32. We're talking about blaspheme in the spirit. So it says, wherefore, uh, Matthew 12, verses 31 to 32. Therefore I say unto you, O mm -hmm. man of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither. Mm. This, this, this is like a, a bomb being dropped right here now. Um, did we move out of the way? <laughs> so it's a bomb right here. Whoa! The word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And do you see what this is saying here? I think sometimes we try to shy away from these verses because it's so very ugh, strong. But we've got to really look at it. We've got to examine it. So when it talks here in verse um, 31 about blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, it's not just yeah, I, having people in an assembly, a church gathering that would be on the side mocking those who are speaking in tongues or whatever, you know, or un under the influence of the Holy Spirit. That's not just it. To say, well, all those people were mocking the, the move of the spirit, so they're blaspheming. This is not just that, this is something else. The sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit has been called the unpardonable sin. Why? Because according to this passage, it is the one sin for which there is no forgiveness. Can you believe that? Strong, huh? So, but God loves us so much though. Are you saying a loving God who forgives sins would not forgive this one? So we have to find out what it is, so we know not to do it, right? It says to blaspheme means to speak abusive words which reject the power of the Holy Spirit as being God and claim it is of Satan. So when somebody takes a stand and says, what I see happening here is not the Holy Spirit. What I see and what I'm hearing this is of Satan. And they tried to do that with Jesus too, if you recall. So, 
you see the spirit of God moving. If you don't know what is happening, don't say anything. Right? Don't say, this is of Satan. <laughs> These people don't know what's going on. This is of Satan. So it says, if a person totally rejects the power of the Holy Spirit, then he can never be saved because this is the Holy Spirit who does what? Draws sinful men to Jesus. He says, you can't come to me unless my spirit draws you, brings conviction, moves you, and say, you know, you need to get saved. You know you've been running far too long. You know that. Come. It's the Holy Spirit that draws us to Christ. So the person is totally, notice it says, totally rejecting the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't, I reject this. I don't want this. I don't believe in this at all. I will have nothing to do with this then that's total rejection of the Holy Spirit, and that's blasphemy. The Holy Spirit produces many visible signs, confirming signs of God's power. Jesus was saying that if a person could not accept these miraculous signs as proof of the truth of the gospel, then what could ever possibly convince that person to believe? So, that's something that you and I don't want ever to do to speak against what God might be doing in our services or in somebody else, right? To reject him and to say, you are not God, you are of Satan. All right, last one. And we will be done. Last week we didn't have enough, right? Last week we, 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 we spoke on things that everybody said, oh, we've heard that before. And so we're like, okay, well, I guess we should have prepared some more then. We didn't want to put too much on the plate at the time. It's good to eat in small amounts at the buffet, right? right. No. Not a, no? <laughs> <laughs> it's good not to have a plate full of food, no, no. right? And then we... <laughs> we want to make sure that we take some nice bites and be satisfied and yeah. take a little bit of this here, Sister Veronica, and a little bit of that here, and a little bit of this, and we're satisfied, right? And not a whole thing to, right, one time, right? Okay, so, last one, vex in the Holy Spirit. Have you ever heard anybody say, don't vex me? <laughs> what does that mean? Okay, um, the Greek actually means to hurt to cause pain and afflict and to be pushed to the limit. So this is it. This is the last straw. They did this and this to me before and they did this other thing and I was okay up to this point, but now this last thing <sighs> has caused me to do what? Explode. <sighs> Fire coming out to the ears, called the um, um, fire brigade. <laughs> Anger to the place where I'm like, mm, that's it. Nah, the last nerve. Got on my last nerve. So how many nerves do you have? <laughs> Got on the last nerve. Vex in the Holy Spirit. That's something we don't want to do. To vex the Holy Spirit means to irritate, annoy provoke or make angry. The Holy Spirit is vexed by the disobedience, can you believe this, and unbelief of mankind. Oh boy, the prophet Isaiah records what happened to God's people, Israel, when they vexed the Holy Spirit. And this was in Isaiah 63 and verse 10. Isaiah 63 and verse 10. What a, a long-suffering God we have. It says, but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them. No, that is something serious. If we get to the place where we vex the Holy Spirit to the point where he is angry. To make God angry? Wow. You wouldn't think it takes a lot to make God angry, right? 
because he's so long suffering and he's so good and he's so loving and he's so kind. But we can do that. We can if we're not careful. We rebel when we don't obey him, when we don't believe what he's saying. That's what it says, disobedience and unbelief. And so it says they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Can you imagine that? And so because of that, he turned the other way and he became their enemy. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be God's enemy because you talk about the enemy, your, the human being that you see in the street that could be your enemy, what that person can do to you, which is, which is terrible, yes. But think about God himself being your enemy. God himself being my enemy. Whew. Mm -mm. That's even worse, a lot worse. And yet he's a merciful God. Think about it. He's a merciful God. But the Bible warns about not vexing the Holy Spirit. We don't want to vex him. We want to make sure that we are obedient to him. We listen for the still small voice. And what he's saying to us <clears throat> might not make sense to us, might not be on our agenda, our list of things to do, or the way we would do them. But we want to make sure when he says, go this way, we go that way. Never know what could be at the end of that road. When he says, do this thing, don't do the other thing. When we rebel, it causes him to be vexed. And then he becomes our enemy. We want him to be our friend. We want him to be our savior, our companion. We want him to be our King of Kings, our Lord of Lords. We want the Holy Spirit to be our comforter. We want him to do what he was sent to do. Lead us into all truth. We want him to teach us all things, right? So if, if that's the case, and, and he's, a, as we said before, he's, a, he's as a gentle dove, not a dove, but he's as a gentle dove. If we do these other things, he will just fly away. He will just say, well, she doesn't want me. She doesn't want me. This one doesn't want me. He wants me. That one wants me. Oh, well, let me come to those who want me. Let me dwell with those who want me. Those who will not allow me to go away. Those who will not vex me. Those who will not blaspheme me. Those who will not insult me. Those who will not lie to me. Those who will not resist me. Those who will not quench me or grieve me. I want to be with those. Amen. So I believe that's the cry of our hearts, that the Holy Spirit dwells with us. And we're going to continue the teaching. We're going to go into other areas so that we can understand fully who the Holy Spirit is and the fact that he wants to be a part of our lives. And he wants to be our life and our all in all. Amen. Here ended the lesson. I hope you got something from this, and I don't know if anybody wants to share anything right now about this. Can I hear something? What did you My think about it? Is not really about the teaching, but why does it work? Not everyone, but 